Part 2, Chapter 3 A Pearl of Ten Millions The next morning at four o'clock I was awakened by the steward, whom Captain Nemo had placed at my service. I rose hurriedly, dressed, and went into the saloon. Captain Nemo was awaiting me. Mr. Aronoff said, he, are, are you ready to start? <sighs> I am ready. Then please to follow me. And my companions, Captain? Oh, they've been told and are waiting. Are we not to put on our divers' dresses? asked I. Not yet. I have not allowed the Nautilus to come too near the coast, and we are some distance from the man in our bank. But the boat is ready and will take us to the exact point of disembarking, which will save us a long way. It carries our diving apparatus, which we will put on when we begin our submarine journey. Captain Nemo conducted me to the central staircase, which led onto the platform. Ned and Council were already there, delighted at the idea of the pleasure party, which was preparing. Five sailors from the Nautilus, with their oars, waited in the boat, which had been made fast against the side. While the night was still dark, layers of clouds covered the sky, allowing but few stars to be seen. I looked on the side where the land lay and saw nothing, but a dark line enclosing three parts of the horizon from southwest to northwest. The Nautilus, having returned during the night up the coast of Sealand, was now west of the bay, or rather gulf, formed by the mainland and the island of Menaire. There, under the dark waters, stretched the Pintadine Bank, an inexhaustible field of pearls the length of which is more than twenty miles. Captain Nemo, Ned Land, Council, and I took our places in the stern of the boat. The master went to the tilter, his four companions leaned on their oars, the painter was cast off, and we sheered off. The boat went towards the south, the oarsmen did not hurry. I noticed that their strokes, strong in the water, followed each other every ten seconds, according to the method generally adopted in the Navy. According to the method, whilst the craft was running by its own velocity, the liquid drops struck the dark depths of the water crisply, like spats of melted lead. A little billow, spreading wide, gave a slight roll to the boat, and some samphire reeds flapped before it. We were silent. What was Captain Nemo thinking of? Perhaps on the land he was approaching, and which he found too near of him, contrary to the Canadian's opinion, who thought it too far off. As to counsel, he was merely there from curiosity. About half past five, the first tints of the horizon showed the upper line of the coast more distinctly. Flat enough in the east, it rose a little to the south. Five miles still lay between us, and it was indistinct owing to the mist, the mist on the water. At six o'clock, it became suddenly daylight with that rapidity peculiar to tropical regions, which now neither dawn nor twilight. The solar rays pierced the clouds, curtain, and piled up on the eastern horizon, and the radiant orb rose rapidly. I saw land distinctly, with a few trees scattered here and there. The boat neared Manar Island, which was rounded to the south. Captain Nemo rose from his seat and watched the sea. At a sign from him, the anchor was dropped, but the chain scarcely ran, for it was little more than a yard deep, and this spot was one of the highest points of the bank of the Pintadines. Here we are, Mr. Aronoff, said Captain Nemo. You see that enclosed bay? Here, in a month, will be assembled the numerous fishing boats of the exporters, and these are the waters their divers will ransacked so boldly. Happily, this bay is well suited for the kind of fishing. It is sheltered from the strongest winds. The sea is never very rough here, which makes it favorable for the dry divers' work. And we will now put on our dresses and begin our walk. I did not answer, and while watching the suspected waves, began with the help of the sailors to put on my heavy sea dress. Captain Nemo and my companions were also dressing. None of the Nautilus men were to accompany us on this new excursion. Soon we were enveloped in the throat of an India rubber clothing, the air apparatus fixed to our backs by braces. As to the room cough apparatus, there was no necessity for it. Before putting my head in the copper cap, I had asked the question of the captain. They would be useless, he replied. We're going to no great depth, and the solar rays will be enough to light our walk. Besides, it would not be prudent to carry the electric light in these waters. Its brilliancy might attract some of the dangerous inhabitants of the coast most inopportunely. As Captain Nemo pronounced these words, I turned to Council and Ned. My two friends had already encased their heads in the metal cap, and they could neither hear nor answer. 
One last question remained to ask of Captain Nemo. And our guns, asked I. Our guns? Guns, what for? Two not mountaineers attacked the bear with a dagger? And is not steel surer than lead? Here's a strong blade. Put it in your belts, and we start. I looked at my companions. They were armed like us, and more than that, Ned Land was brandishing an enormous harpoon, which he had placed in the boat before leaving the Nautilus. Then, following the captain's example, I allowed myself to be dressed in a heavy copper helmet, and our reservoirs of air were at once in activity. An instant after we were landed, one after the other, in about two feet of water upon an even sand. Captain Nemo made a sign with his hand, and we followed him by a gentle declivity till we disappeared under the waves. Over our feet, like convoys of snipe in a bog, rose shoals of fish of the genus Monopatera, which have no other fins but their tails. I recognized the Javanese, a real serpent, two and a half feet long, of a livid color underneath, and which might easily be mistaken for a conger eel if it was not for the golden stripes on its sides. In the genius Stromacheus, whose bodies are all very flat and oval, I saw some of the most brilliant colors, carrying their dorsal fin like a scythe, an excellent eating fish which, dried and pickled, is known by the name of caraway. Then some trachobars belonging to the genius Apophysoides, whose body is covered with a shell curious of eight longitudinal plates. The heightening sun let the mass of waters more and more, and the soil changed by degrees. To the fine sand succeeded a perfect causeway of boulders covered with a carpet of mollusks and zoophytes. Amongst the specimens of these bran branches, I noticed some placini with thin, unequal shells, a kind of ostracian peculiar to the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean. Some orange lucini with rounded shells, rockfish three feet and a half long, which raise themselves under the waves like hands ready to seize one. There were also some panoprees, slightly luminous, and lastly, some oculines, like magnificent fans, forming one of the richest vegetations of these seas. In the midst of these living plants and under the arbors of the hydrophytes were layers of clumsy articulates, particularly some raninae, whose carapace formed a slightly rounded triangle, and some horrible-looking parthenopes. At about seven o'clock, we found ourselves at last surveying the oyster banks, of which the poor pearl oysters are reproduced by millions. Captain Nemo pointed with his hand to the enormous heap of oysters, and I could well understand that this mine was inexhaustible, for nature's creative powers far beyond man's instinct for destruction. Ned Land, faithful in his instinct, hastened to fill a net which he carried by his side with some of the finest specimens. But we could not stop. We must follow the captain, who seemed to guide himself by paths known only to himself. The ground was sensibly rising, and sometimes, on holding up my arm, it was above the surface of the sea. Then the level of the bank would sink capriciously. Often we rounded high rocks, scarped into pyramids, and their dark fracture, large crustacea perched upon their high claws like some war machine, watched us with fixed eyes, and under our feet crawled various kinds of anilids. At this moment, there opened before us a large grotto, dug in a picturesque heap of rocks and carpeted with all the thick warp of the submarine flora. At first, it seemed very dark to me. The solar rays seemed to be extinguished by successive gradations, until its vague transparency became nothing more than drowned light. Captain Nemo entered, and we followed. The eyes soon accustomed themselves to this relative state of darkness. I could distinguish the arches springing capriciously from natural pillars standing broad upon their granite base, like the heavy columns of Tuscan architecture. Why had our incomprehensible guide led us to the bottom of this submarine crypt? I was soon to know. After descending a rather sharp declivity, our, our feet trod the bottom of a kind of circular pit. There Captain Nemo stopped, and with his hand indicated an object I had not yet perceived. It was an oyster of extraordinary dimensions, a gigantic tridacne, a goblet which could have contained a whole lake of holy water, a basin the breadth of which was more than two yards and a half, and consequently larger 
than that ornamenting the saloon of the Nautilus. Well, I approached this extraordinary mollusk. It adhered by its byssus to the table of granite, and there, isolated, it developed itself into the calm waters of the grotto. Well, I estimated the weight of the tritid cani at 600 pounds. Such an oyster would contain 30 pounds of meat, and one must have the stomach of a gargantua to demolish some dozens of them. Captain Nemo was evidently acquainted with the existence of this bivalve, and seemed to have a particular motive in verifying the actual state of this tridacne. The shells were little open. The captain came near and put his dagger between to prevent them from closing. Then with his hand, he raised the membrane with its fringed edges, which formed a cloak for the creature. There, between the folded plates, I saw a loose pearl, whose size equaled that of a coconut. The globular shape, perfect clearness, and admirable luster made it altogether a jewel of inestimable value. Carried away by my curiosity, I stretched out my hand to seize it, weigh it, and touch it, but the captain stopped me made a sign of refusal, and quickly withdrew his dagger, and the two shells closed suddenly. I then understood Captain Nemo's intention. In leaving this pearl hidden in the mantle of the Tridendacne, he was allowing it to grow slowly. Each year, the secretions of the mollusk would add new concentric circles. Well, I estimated a value of 500,000 pounds at least. After ten minutes, Captain Nemo stopped suddenly, and I thought he had halted previously to returning. No. By a gesture, he bade us crouch beside him in a deep fracture of the rock. His hand pointed to one part of the liquid mass, which I watched attentively. About five yards from me, a shadow appeared and sank to the ground. The disquieting idea of sharks shot through my mind, but I was mistaken. And once again, it was not a monster of the ocean that we had anything to do with. It was a man, a living man, an Indian, a fisherman, a poor devil who I suppose had come to gleam before the harvest. Well, I could see the bottom of his canoe anchored some feet above his head. He dived and went up successfully. A stone held between his feet, cut in the shape of a sugar loaf, whilst a rope fastened him to the boat, helped him to descend more rapidly. This was all his apparatus. Reaching the bottom about five yards deep, he went on his knees and filled his bag with oysters, picked up at random, then he went up, emptied it, pulled up the stone, and began the operation once more, which lasted 30 seconds. The diver did not see us. The shadow of the rock hid us from sight, and how should this poor Indian ever dream that men, beings like myself, should be there under the water watching his movements and losing no detail of the fishing? Several times he went up this way and dived again. He did not carry any more than, than ten at each plunge, and he was obliged to pull them from the bank to which they adhered by means of their strong vices. And how many of these oysters for which he risked his life had no pearl in them? Well, I watched him closely. His maneuvers were regular, and for the space of half an hour no danger appeared to threaten him. I was beginning to accustom myself to the sight of this interesting fishing. When suddenly, as the Indian was on the ground, I saw him make a gesture of terror, rise, and make a spring to return to the surface of the sea. I understood his dread. A gigantic shadow appeared just above the unfortunate diver. It was a shark of enormous size, advancing diagonally, his eyes on fire and his jaws open. I was mute with horror and unable to move. The voracious creature shot towards the Indian, who threw himself on one side in order to avoid the shark's fins, but not his tail, for it struck his chest and stretched him to the ground. The last scene lasted but a few seconds. The shark returned, and turning on his back, prepared himself for cutting the Indian in two. When I saw Captain Nemo rise suddenly, and then dagger in hand, walk straight to the monster, ready to fight face to face with him. The very moment the shark was going to snap the unhappy fisherman in two, he perceived his new adversary and turning over, made straight toward him. I can still see Captain Nemo's position. Holding himself well together, he waited for the shark with admirable coolness. And when it rushed at him, threw himself on one side with wondrous quickness, avoiding the shock and burying his dagger deep into its side. But it was not over. A terrible combat ensued. The shark had seemed to roar 
if it might so. The blood rushed in torrents from its wound. The sea was dyed red, and through the opaque liquid I could distinguish nothing more. Nothing more until the moment when light lightning I saw the undaunted captain hanging on to one of the creature's fins, struggling as it were, hand in hand with the monster and dealing successive blows at his enemy, yet still unable to give a decisive one. The shark's struggles agitated the water with such fury that the rocks threatened to upset me. I wanted to go to the captain's assistance, but nailed to the spot with horror I could not stir. I saw the haggard eye. I saw the different phases of the fight. The captain fell to the earth, upset by the enormous mass which leapt upon him. The shark's jaws opened wide like a pair of factory shears, and it would have been all over with the captain, but quick as thought, harpoon in hand, Ned Land rushed toward the shark and struck it with its sharp point. The waves were impregnated with a mass of blood. They rocked under the shark's movements, which beat them with indescribable fury. Ned Land had not missed his aim. It was the monster's death rattle. Struck to the heart, it struggled in dreadful convulsions, the shock of which overthrew counsel. But Ned Land had disentangled the captain, who, getting up without any wound, went straight to the Indian quickly cut the cord which held him to a stone, took him in his arms with a sharp blow of his heel, mounted to the surface. We all three followed in a few seconds, saved by a miracle, and reached the fisherman's boat. Captain Nemo's first care was to recall the unfortunate man to life again. Why well, did not think he could succeed. I hope so, for the poor creature's immersion was not long, but the blow from the shark's tail might have been his death blow. Happily, with the captains and councils, Sharp friction, I saw conscious return by degrees. He opened his eyes. What was his surprise, his terror even, at seeing four great copper heads leaning over him? And above all, what must he have thought when Captain Nemo, drawing from the pocket of his dress a bag of pearls, placed it in his hand? This mun munificent charity from the man of the waters to the poor Singalese was accepted with a trembling hand. His wondering eyes showed that he knew not what superhuman beings he owed both fortune and life. At a sign from the captain, he regained the bank, and following the road already traversed, came in about half an hour to the anchor, which held the canoe of the Nautilus to the earth. Once on board, we each, with the help of the sailors, got rid of the heavy copper helmet. Captain Nemo's first word was the Canadian. Thank you, Master Land, said he. It wasn't revenge, Captain, replied Ned Land. I owed you that. A ghastly smile passed across the captain's lips, and that was all. To the Nautilus, said he. When well, the boat flew over the waves, some minutes after we met the shark's dead body floating. By the black marking of the extremity of its fins, I recognized the terrible Melampteron of the Indian Seas, of the species of shark properly so called. It was more than 25 feet long. Its enormous mouth occupied one-third of its body. It was an adult. It was known by its six rows of teeth placed in an isosceles triangle in the upper jaw. Council looked at it, looked at it with scientific interest, and I am sure that he placed it, and not without reason, in the cartilaginous cast of the Candrophenipian order with fixed gills of the Selassian family in the genius of the sharks. Whilst I was contemplating this inert mast, a dozen of those ferocious beasts appeared around the boat, and without noticing us threw themselves upon the dead body, and fought with one another for the pieces. At half past eight we were again on board the Nautilus, where I reflected on the incidents which had taken place, and our excursion to the Minar Bank. Two conclusions I must inevitably draw from it. One, bearing upon the unparalleled courage of Captain Nemo, the other upon his devotion to a human being, a representative of that race from which he fled beneath the sea. Whatever he might say, this strange man had not yet succeeded in entirely crushing his heart. When I made this observation to him, he answered in a slightly moved tone. That Indian, sir, is an inhabitant of an oppressed country, and I am still, and shall be to my last breath, one of them.